Welcome to Indigenous Arts Mentorship in the Valley. My name is Jonathan Mirren, and on behalf of Valley Arts Mentors, we're all really glad you could make it this evening. Valley Arts Mentors is a collaboration of Holyoke Media, PT Theater Company, and Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Franklin County. And our mission is to strengthen the regional arts ecosystem by supporting early career artists with webinars like these and a mentorship program that's currently accepting new registrations. Uh, I also wanna start off by thanking our funders who are making this possible, Mass Humanities, the Community Foundation of Western Mass, and the Mass Cultural Council through a variety of local cultural councils. Uh, I'd also like to um, welcome Jason Montgomery, the project manager for this webinar series, who's been helping us, who's gonna be monitoring the, um, the chat and the Q&A tonight. He's with Attack Bear Press. And without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator, David Brule, who I had the pleasure of meeting a few years ago in the context of some local history work up in Franklin County. And David will offer a land acknowledgement and introduce our panelists. David is the president of the Nolan Bika Project, a member of the Nahantic Tribal Council and coordinator of the National Park Service study of the 1676 massacre at Peskyomskut. David, welcome. Welcome, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. It's really good to see everyone again. Yes, I'm David, David Brule, and uh, I'm uh, speaking to you from the, my river address is the Bagwag, uh, known to some people as the Miller's River. A lot of us identify with streams and big rivers, and so I really uh, like to mention that. I'm uh, When we start off, we typically want to acknowledge a number of things. One is that we are standing on and benefiting from indigenous land. Uh, this land in the central Connecticut River Valley, as well as most of the Northeast and the rest of the continent of Turtle Island uh, was and is native land. The Pocumpet people lived in the central Connecticut River Valley. Their descendants are still here among us, among the Abenaki, among the Mohican. From this part of the valley on down through towards what, what we now know as Springfield, there were a number of um, clans and kinfolk of the Pocumtuck, including the Nanatok Nawadak, the Agawam, the Warrenoko. We acknowledge we are benefiting from their land. Our close cousins, the Nipmuc, just to our immediate east, and our cousins, the Abeniki, to the north. All of these people represent this central valley and we need to acknowledge that in many cases the Indian land was taken away oftentimes through violent means. We are working really hard to bring that to the consciousness of people in the area not to create guilt but to create an understanding of history that has been erased in a lot of ways. The Nolambika Project uh, is basically what those of us who are part of it, Jennifer and myself and Diane Dix and a number of the board members, we call ourselves kind of a go-between. We are intermediaries. We try to establish links like this uh, between tribal and non-tribal people through events that we offer. Our uh, keynote event is the Pocumptuck Homelands Festival. Most people here on our panel were part of that over the past seven years, eight years. We have one coming up. Reserve your, your mark your calendars for August 6th and 7th. Um, we envision uh, Connecticut River Valley where the histories and cultures of indigenous people are recognized and celebrated. 
this panel tonight is going to be one of those types of events. So I'm going to uh, name our panelists. I won't say anything beyond that other than they are all close friends and we really appreciate their willingness to participate. So uh, for those of you who are listening and watching, uh, we have uh, Jennifer Lee, Dan Shears, Deborah Moorhead, and Liz Coldwind Santana Kaiser on our panel. So uh, what you, you will have a chance to ask questions if you have a burning question and you would like to uh, ask that before we reach the end of the four presentations, you can certainly uh, go through Jason Montgomery, who will be uh, monitoring the chat and question line. Otherwise, we'll have plenty of time at the end of all the four presentations to uh, do uh, some questions and answers. Okay, excellent. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jennifer Lee, and she will take the time she needs to tell you about what she does and how mentoring and mentorship has been very important for her. Okay, can you hear me? Yes? Yes. Okay. Uh, so hi, everybody in Cyberland. Um, I'm uh, enrolled with the Northern Narragansett. We are an unrecognized group that has Narragansett ancestry. Uh, I live here in Plainfield, Massachusetts. I'm 67 years old and I make bark baskets and uh, it's really fun. So the way I got started making bark baskets was from studying history. I knew growing up that the uh, information that I got in schools and the ideas that I had in my head from movies and books and media was just all wrong. And so it's really been my lifelong journey to educate myself, to really find out what happened here and what is happening here in Native America. Um, so in history, I kept reading about how important bark is to the Northeast Woodland tribes. Uh, like the buffalo is to the Lakota people, bark is to all the Northeast Woodland peoples. And so um, I would go to conferences. Uh, there was a great conference called the Eastern Indian Historical Conference. It was in Ohio. And I would go out there every year with some friends and just learn everything about weaving and what types of things were used and what time periods. And you know, everyone talked about the bark, but I didn't really see much bark work. So um, one day, I, a couple of friends and I, we said, we just really wanna to try to make something out of bark. So we set a date. And we said, we're meeting at my house and we're gonna sit on my porch with our bark and with the roots we've gathered and see what we can do. And so we made my friend, Aaron Foster, he had this elm tree that was growing into his basement. He had to take it down. So he brought all this elm bark and we just had a blast. I mean, oh, that basket is really, really a wackadoo basket, but we had so much fun. And I started, um, when I go to powwows and I wasn't yet into dancing so much. So I would bring bark and sit and make baskets while I watched the dancers and met people and heard, listened to the MC for education and uh, kids would sit with me and they want to make bark baskets. So I'd always brought extra bark and I would tell the kids, here's the deal. I'll share my materials. It's all stuff I've gathered in the woods, hands and knees on my hands and knees, getting the roots and peeling the bark and, uh, I'll share it with you under one condition, and that is that you finish your basket. You don't, I just would feel terrible if you left with an unfinished basket, because that's no fun. So uh, I did that for a while. And then the tribal museums, uh, like Kearsage Museum, uh, they asked me to teach a class. And I had never done that before, you know, but I said, well, what the heck, it's fun, you know. And um, I had different people come to visit. Um, once the historical Nipmuc tribe came to my house, there was about 17 people and it was bark season and we all peeled bark and gathered branches. And it was one of the most happiest 
experiences I could imagine. Just hanging out with people, making these items from the woods around us. You know, no money involved, just, yeah, I, I guess the word I have for it is cultural well-being. Um, and I, I went to a, uh, I did a class at Kearsage Museum and a basket maker, a non-native basket maker, Jean Reed, she said, you know, if you want to do more with this basket making, I could help you out. And she kind of took me under her wing and introduced me to these conventions that happen uh, like North Carolina, Virginia, Michigan, um, the Upper Peninsula. There's these basket conventions. People come from all over the world to learn different styles of basketry. I mean, imagine like, you know, the Hilton Hotel with those uh, brass things that carry your, your luggage and you've got like hundreds of basket makers and they all got dirt under their fingernails. They got rough hands, you know, it was just really cool. So um, that's kind of how, how things came along. And um, people encouraged me to, to, to follow my heart and to make these baskets. And people like Joyce Odawa and Granny Osage and Dan Runnels and uh, Marge Bruchak and Troy Phillips, they really encouraged me to keep following my heart and doing what I love to do. And that, that meant a lot to me. And I think about that a lot as far as mentoring. Sometimes a little encouragement can mean the world to somebody. So um, another place I really learned was, it was at a powwow in Shelburne, Vermont. And uh, Mick Mac man came in with all this birch bark and sat down and started making baskets. And uh, I said, could I sit with you and watch? He said, yes. And he said, uh, you know, these aren't baskets, these are buckets. These are so strong, they're buckets. And he had like a sheetrock bucket with that apron around it with all the tools, you know, the pliers and screwdrivers. And I never thought you'd use those for making baskets, but anyway, it's been uh, a real honor and pleasure to go to different tribal communities and teach basketry. It's the happiest thing I could imagine doing. I've been up to Akwesasne and had Penobscot and families come and hung out with an Olhegan Abenaki doing a basket class just for fun. Um, my kids make baskets, my grandkids make baskets. It's just happiness. Um, it's great when, when I can make some money at it too, that's good but it doesn't always have to be. And sometimes it's more fun to just forget the money stuff and just have fun making these. So, and uh, there was one time when I started, uh, people wanted me to teach classes. I was like, why would anybody want to pay so much money to learn how to make a basket? They could buy one for me for less. And so I took a basket class and uh, I paid like, I paid $130 to take this class but it's got cedar bark and hickory bark and yellow cedar. And uh, I sat there in this hotel for a whole day while Diane Stanton handed me materials and taught me how to twine. It was so much fun. It was like, okay, I get it. It's, it's just really a riot. Um, and the thing about making bark baskets is that it teaches you history like because bark baskets is a seasonal thing, I began to understand that my native ancestors weren't just wandering around a wilderness. They were following a very specific seasonal round to harvest materials at a very specific time. And if you miss that time, that's it for the year. You know, so it, I, I got, it's like a, a window into thinking about how our ancestors um, managed. And then a really fun story is about this basket, which is it's one piece of white pine bark folded up with a stick through it. So I had heard about this kind of basket for decades. I had read about it. It's called like a trail bucket. You're on the trail. It's summertime. The bark will peel. You don't have time to stitch it up, but you can fold it, put a stick in it, and now you have a container. And uh, I was up at Aquasasne and uh, Alicia Cook said, Jennifer, I just got to show you something my grandfather left. He said this was a very big basket and I couldn't believe it. It, it was uh, maybe twice the size of this. And she's like, is that a berry picking basket? And I couldn't believe it. That's what I had read about for so, so long. And to see one 
it, it was just amazing as a highlight. So um, what I can say to people who are called to different arts, to making things, you know, follow your heart. That's the best thing. And, and take opportunities. Opportunities come up and you take them. Like, you know, when, when Jean asked me to go to a convention, I was like, well, you got to pay for a hotel and you got to pay for travel and then you got to get down there. And, you know, but I, I took the chance and I was so happy I did because it opened up whole, a whole world and it gave me a chance to share with people from all over the world, the Northeast woodland traditions. So um, that's, that's, my, that's my story. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I mean, I've known Jennifer for a while and I know she's got hours of stories, but we're making sure that, well, I want to give Liz a cold wind a heads up. Well, I'll ask her to speak in another minute or two, but I just wanted to um, kind of ask uh, Jennifer. So you mentioned a couple of people who were your mentors and uh, some people I recognized, but so were there... Were they, were they constant mentors or did you they come in and out of your sphere as you were uh, making your way through your, uh, your, your craft? Well, they were friends. Like Dan Runnels um, was a professor at Dartmouth and he was a friend from the reenactment mm -hmm. actually. And he just, he loved what I was doing and the fact mm -hmm. that he loved it, you know, and encouraged me to keep doing it. So a lot of these people came and came and went. I mean, Granny Osage is passed on now, but she was a, an Osage woman born in a sod house in Oklahoma. She adopted me and um, just her encouragement just meant the world. Mm -hmm. And Joyce Odawa, well, there's only one Joyce Odawa. She lives in Florida now, but uh, yeah, she said, quit, quit buying things from other people and make them yourself. <laughs> One, one last question for me. I don't know if Jason has anybody lined up yet with, a, with an active question. Um, if not, uh, so far, okay, Jason. Yeah, one of, one of the things that popped into my head is uh, I know you've been all over the Northeast and beyond. Do you find uh, different basket styles in different communities, or is there a kind of a common thread that flows throughout all from Aquasasne to the Penobscot to the Abenaki to the Narragansett? Is, is there a, are there connecting things or are there specific tribal things? We certainly know in pottery, people try to determine uh, a people and a period by looking at Is there anything, yep, yeah, sorry. Is there anything comparable to that in basketry? You know, the woven baskets, you have a lot more uh, examples in existence at museums where you can identify tribes. The bark baskets are few and far between. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I went to Michigan that I saw an ash bark muckuck. And it was a very different style than the birch bark muckucks of the Mi'kmaq people. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And the birch bark that I saw at Narragansett was a different style, but you know, they're just really few and far between. So I, I don't know if you could mm -hmm. really uh, designate, you know, there's maybe one example. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. That was the question I had. Uh, I'm sure that others will pop up. I'm going to, uh, I've already queued up Liz and uh, I would like, Liz, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself and your affiliation, a little bit about what's close to your heart and then a little bit about uh, your, your art and your craft and what you've been doing. Okay, um, hi everyone. My name is Liz Coldwin Santana Kaiser. I'm an elder councilwoman and serving as the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. Um, my job, I feel right now, is to secure any artifacts and try to protect uh, burial sites. Um, through a lot of the digs that are going on, have been going on forever, um, just trying to protect our ancestors and make sure that they stay at rest. Um, and I've been doing that for a few years, but I've been working with 
my tribe, which is the Chabanagogamog Band of Nipmuc Indians um, for many years. And through the years, I've earned my eagle feather. Um, and that came from Little Crow Henrys, who was our spiritual leader. He is passed, um, but his spirit lives on and lives with us always. So I would like to talk a little bit about who mentored me. Um, my mother and my grandmother, my first mentors. Um, they were very creative women. They were the ones who would decorate our house. And when I say decorate our house, we were not able to buy new furniture and new furniture was out of the question. So they would have old furniture and what we would do, and I did this as a little girl, we would sand it. And back then we didn't have sanders or anything like that. We sand with sandpaper because my knuckles would always say that. But we would sand it, we would paint it, we would shellac it. And once the furniture was done, we had a beautiful home. We couldn't afford the new furniture, but my mom and my grandmother knew how to make our home beautiful. As well as my aunts, my aunts were creative and they were a big, big inspiration to me as well. Um, my grandmother, my mom were our first clothes designers. We learned to sew, we learned to make dresses and pants from clothes that were handed down to us from other family members or from old cloth. But we learned to sew, we learned to make our clothes. Um, these women were creative and they were able to use whatever was available to them. They were very inspiring to me. Another inspiration to me was my dad and my uncle Reggie. My uncle Reggie, they both were artists, dancers and entertainers. My uncle Reggie was a painter and he would sit for hours and hours talking with us about stories about him and my dad and growing up. And some of his stories were so beautiful and then some of them were very sad because they had a very hard life. But the stories were so amazing and I'm able to pass them on. He also taught me to stay with what was in my heart. He told me to paint. He told me to do the things that I needed to do. And so with that, I love him and my dad for that. Another person that I want to personally thank, um, who was a big inspiration to me, her name was Pat Goward. Pat Goward was a Nipmuc elder and she was a very special mentor to me. And little did she know how much she inspired me to do the things that I'm doing today. She was a creative lady who would hold classes to teach us how to make traditional clothing and all other items. She would invite people from the tribe to go to our site and office, because that's where we were, and we would work and do, make all sorts of things. She was a big, big mentor for me. In my role, okay, as a mentor, began with my kids. In helping my kids understand their traditions and their culture was a job for me. We worked together on many, many projects. We worked on so many projects and we worked not only with my kids, but with their friends and other, other folks that had lived around us. We were doing so much mentoring with so many kids that my husband and I, in the, in the place that we lived, we found an old building where we could actually open and develop a, um, a resource center a community resource center where it was for the whole community. There, I mentored um, adults as well as kids. Um, it was one of the, the best years of my life. Um, we partnered up with the Worcester Public Schools at that time and trying to help um, kids who were just having a lot of problems in school. Um, today, um, I serve on a lot of nonprofit boards and do a lot of community presentations, hoping to give insight about Nipmuc people. And when I say that, it's because it's often believed by some people that we no longer exist, or for some people that we should look a certain way, uh, that we may look like the, our folks out West, well, we don't. 
we come in all different shades. We have different hair textures, straight, curly, blonde, red extensions. We look different and we live different, but we are native. So we all don't look alike and we don't all live alike, but we are here. And when I'm not doing these presentations or working with groups, <laughs> I spend my time working on Cold Winds Creations, which are my medicine bags. And like my mom, I do, I've learned to work with materials given to me from Mother Earth, shells, feathers, wood, is a, uh, some of the materials that I use. And this is my love and my passion, creating a one of a kind, unique bag. I am guided by the spirit and I am inspired by the creator. And I just wanna say thank you for hearing me, but I also would like to show you a few of my bags that I do make. And when I say I use everything that I have, I do, I throw away. And this is all material that I use and shred and cut and design. And, and I tell you that it's, it's a one of a kind because I can't do it again. I have had people ask for artists to make a certain thing like they saw. And I said, I could do close to it, but I can't do the same thing. I'm just not able to do that, which I appreciate because then everything is a one of a kind and it's very unique. And it's a passion that I love doing. And it was inspired by my family, by the things that I was mentored through the years. I was able to share with other people and other folks. And I appreciate everything that I have for that. Thank you for having me. I hope. Um, I'd like to, uh, I'll, I'll queue up uh, Deborah in a bit. Uh, as soon as uh, we are ready to move on from Liz, but I'm not quite finished yet. I just, uh, I met Liz about four or five years ago uh, on, and she joined the uh, advisory board of the Battlefield Study. Uh, there was a horrific massacre, as many of you know, at Pesky Olmskut. Uh, we know who the victims were in a lot of ways and some many many were nameless many nipmuc people many abenaki many wampanoag and many narragansett perished that day but liz joined our board we we've been um, overseeing archaeology and local history research around the atrocity at the falls for 10 years now uh I just realized that when we hit 2022, mm -hmm. I was still thinking in terms of, uh, you know, some earlier date, but we are actually, I, I don't want to overdo it. That we're in the ninth year, but um, Liz has joined us and we, it has been uh, incredibly important to have her voice on the board along with uh, the Wampanoag, uh, the Narragansett and the Abenaki. So, uh, Liz is being, well, like all of us, is kind of sharing a little part of what we do because we are all really deep into a whole lot of things. Uh, Liz, I just want to ask one more question, and this is beyond your creation, but I know that you spoke eloquently about uh, the burials yes. and the uh, remains that in some cases were being desecrated on Deer Island and another island that you've been traveling back and forth to. And yeah. many, as you people, people may well know, many, many Nipmuc in the so-called praying towns were displaced during the King Philip's War and left to left to perish mm -hmm. on these uh, for terrible islands out in Boston Harbor. So do you want to share anything about that before we, we ask Deborah to uh, uh, present mm -hmm. to us? 
Yes. Uh, right now we were we are in court um, trying to um, at least have it it stop until we can find out where the burial sites are and um, if we if there are and there are our bones and, and our, our ancestors there. What can we do to if we have to remove them or can we leave them? Right now, with the mayor uh, Wu, I believe her name is, um, did not have a very good, I should say, words for us um, at our last um, writing that we got. And um, right now, Ken White, who is the chairperson, um, we're getting ready to hopefully go back to court to see where we're at and what is our rights as having it you know, stopped because they want to build a, um, a center, a drug center over there, of all things, a drug center. Um, knowing that the, that that island was an island that they know they sent our people and they know died there, but there's no respect for the fact of our bones are there. There's no, and they know this. And so I guess I, I find it so hard to accept the fact that they're finding it so hard to give us the respect to be able to go there and, and remove our bones if that's what they're gonna make us do and rebury our ancestors so that they can have peace. So we're in an uproar with that right now. It's very hurtful because we, we thought we came such a long way to get such a bad writing from them. Um, so again, we're fighting for our ancestors to, to have peace. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, Liz. I I, I knew that was uh, a sensitive topic, but it's something that is incredibly uh, widespread among Indian communities, Native communities, protecting protecting uh, ancestors' uh, spirits and remains, actual physical yes. remains. Um, do we have something going on, Jason? Uh, I see chats and a couple of questions, but if it's not time yet, we can move on. Um, well, you, there are a couple of questions. One was for Jennifer and then one with general general question for the entire panel asking if you have it's social media or Instagram or any of those other wonderful ways for artists to get in touch with you. And then I believe for Jennifer, we um, had a question about when is bark season? Yeah. So go ahead with it, Jennifer, if you want, and then we'll go to Deborah and pick up uh, with the social media thing uh, after, after everybody's presented. So anything special, Jen? Okay, so bark season is usually early spring, um, but some trees like the linden trees will slip in the winter. And sometimes uh, the white pine will slip in the summer and fall and ash will slip in the summer. So it, it really varies. Um, it really, you have to kind of get to know what your trees and your locale are doing. And it varies by the weather that we're having and where the tree is growing. Like if the tree is growing uh, in an open area, that's different season than the tree that's growing in the uh, wood. So I keep notes every year. And some years I get, um, I get fooled. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I'm really, I'm going to pass the, the, the uh, put, put, put Deborah on the spot at this point. And I'm really uh, anxious to hear from her. Um, we're really, in a lot of ways, privileged to have uh, Deborah, who is of the Pocanoket Wampanoag community that uh, the Wampanoags came to our valley uh, regularly over 10,000 years. And I think it's just really great that we have a chance to hear from her. Uh, Deborah was at the Vakumtak Homelands Festival this summer and uh, just made a fantastic impression and has done an extraordinary mural for the Noel Beaker project of uh, an incident just before King Philip swore when uh, the, I'll be polite, when John Pynchon um, from Springfield and beyond, actually downriver, right, Jen, uh, 
discovered he was starving as people were starving after having slaughtered the Pequots and they were busy killing people instead of farming. And he bought an uh, incredible amount of corn from the Pocumtuck people up in what's now known as Deerfield. So Deborah did a fantastic mural for us and, and it's just going to be, people are, are, are clamoring. Many of the towns that we work with want copies and want to know how to get it. So uh, it's just been wonderful. So anyway, uh, Deborah, I'll uh, turn it over to you and tell us a little bit about yourself and your art and as the others have done. Oh, thank you. Uh, are you ever ready, really um, ready for these talks? I'm always like, I can handle this. I remember <laughs> somebody said, and they said to me, Debbie, you know everything that you have to talk about. So why, you know, it's like you don't have to get ready for this. And uh, <laughs> I still feel like I have to get ready for this. So yeah. <laughs> um, I want to know about my affiliation, like he said. I'm uh, a Seekonk Poconok at Wampanoag. I have ancestry to um, all the tribes, pretty much the, um, from Cherokee to Mohawk to um, Pequot to Nipmuc to Narragansett to Wampanoag. Uh, you know, I'm an Eastern Woodland woman. Uh, however, my strongest line is through my mater maternal line, which was my mother's who was a Seekonk Wampanoag. But little did we know that my mother's father was the direct line to Massasoit. Nobody knew that because he passed away building a church so that the missionaries would stop bothering the native people. So I don't know if everybody knows the history of uh, Anawan's uh, rock and Anyways, after King Philip's war, my ancestors, um, after King Philip was killed, the Anawan took the rest of the tribe out of the swamp and um, took them to a place called Anawan's Rock. And the last thing he said to King Philip and all the warriors was Autash, stand tall. So they eventually get captured at Anawan's Rock and Anawan says, uh, I'll, I'll go with you to Massachusetts Bay Colony if you allow the rest of the tribe to go free. So uh, that's what happened. So, uh, so we didn't know, I mean, Tall Oak, I didn't think I had mentors, but actually, actually when I was just starting to wanna know, which was really young, Actually, it was in the, like, I guess I was in my 20s when Tolo told me that story about Anawan, and it all made sense because my mother's tribe was 10, 10 minutes away from Anawan's rock, and they're still there. So um, that's who I'm affiliated with, and I find that a tribe, the Poconokets, are really splintered, and it's, you know, we need unification so bad. But... Um, so I was just like, today I was writing this uh, proposal for some funding to help me put together some site-based um, cultural tourism. Uh, and it's a kind of cool thing because they came to me, I didn't go to them, so <laughs> that helps. But I'm not saying that writing these kind of things are easy. Any, everything that I write, it just seems like I'm like saying the same thing over again. They did us wrong as native people, like we always have to fight, but the, the lady that I was writing this proposal for, she said to me, what is the reason why you want to do this? And so I think this is like the heart of my uh, paper or the heart of the reason why I do what I wanna do. And I think it's, this is pretty much the same for most Eastern Woodland people. So I'm just gonna read you this one paragraph that I wrote. Uh, this is personal for me from what I, as well as many other Eastern Woodland Native Americans have experienced while in elementary school. To read the lessons about my tribe's history was devastating to my sense of identity. What was officially being taught as the authoritative narrative of the country 
was my family, my relatives, my tribe, and I were non-existent. So, I mean, I think that's where many of the Eastern Woodland people get their motivation. And so, um, so when I was young, younger, well, when I was like really young, I, um, I always asked the questions like, where are the people that look like us? That phone, I, I put it on airplane and it's still going well. It doesn't even, it does this to me all the time. It never listens to me. Even on airplane, I can turn it off. It'll still come on. So anyways, so when I was um, like before elementary school, I was asking about where are the people that look like me? So my um, grandmother made me draw pictures to, so that I wouldn't talk a lot. So I wouldn't ask a lot of questions. So, um, so I did, so that's when I started being an artist and uh, I still asked a million questions and I still feel really spiritual towards my ancestors. I mean, right now I have this um, purse that was my grandmother's and, and then I have like uh, receipts from my grandfather who was, um, I don't know when he was born. I forgot when he was born, but the receipts are from 1910. It was before my mother was even born. So I spent most of my life asking about these questions, asking about everything about native. So, um, so then I went to college because, you know, being brought up to just draw instead of speak, um, I ended up being pretty good at um, duplicating anything I could see. So um, I went to art school and in art school, I said, you know, where are the native people that I can relate to? I really, you know, like I need to relate. And everybody, you know, category, they all were like, I would tell them I'm Native American, you know, Wampanoag, Narragansett, and nobody would like actually go 100% in with me that I was that. And I think, and I know it's because of what was written in history about us. I mean, they were like, are you Cape Verdean? Are you mulatto? And, you know, and I'm like, I'm Native American, you know, with some African and some Spanish ancestry, maybe and some Irish too. But, you know, most people would say things to me like, uh, we think you're Indian, but other people think you're black. <laughs> and I got that so many times. And I'm like, yeah, like what else is new? So, um, so I just keep, plugging along and I do a lot of paintings. Um, and so I said to my professor, I really would like somebody that was Native American that could be my mentor. You know, I'd like a teacher that could teach me art. Well, there wasn't any. The close I had was um, the um, Latino. They responded to me, you know, they would say something to me like, yeah, we believe you're Indian and stuff like that. But I didn't have a Native American mentor, but who I had was as mentors, they weren't mentors for me as an artist. I, I was on my own as an artist, Native American artist, really. The only artist that in the East Coast, there wasn't anybody that was doing East Coast woodland Native American people. So uh, I was on my own, Southwest. And I what I wanted to do was totally um, define myself as Northeastern and undefine any Native American art that came from here. I didn't want it to be known as, oh, oh, I know the uh, Navajos out south in Southwest. Everything was brought to them. And I'm like, why do you have to talk about them when I'm sitting right here in front of you? Our tribes are here, you know? So um, I think uh, for a while there, Tall Oak was a mentor to me just, you know, in the native um, aspects of, you know, identity. Um, then, you know, I tried to get our tribe back together from splinters and learn more. And so um, I was really frustrated an awful lot. And so, and I would be upset and I knew there was things that like, I was all very different than people. Um, I, I don't know, being an artist and also just the person that knew things that I didn't know how I knew. So, and it was really prominent. My daughter is like that too. So 
everybody, my family, my siblings would call me weird. And, you know, being called weird all the time kind of gets to you after a while. So I would, I met Slow Turtle and I asked him, every time I saw him, I would ask him questions, you know, what is happening to me? Why am I so weird? Why, why don't, why don't other people know the things that I know? How come I'm an artist? And, and, you know, he would, he took me under his wing and he was like, um, you know, you have these gifts. They're not, they're not weird. They're, you're a native person and these are your gifts. And so he kind of grounded me in that. And then um, I became very close to him and his wife and his children. And um, so then, hmm. Then uh, he brought me to the um, a sonnet band of Wampanoags, and that was the um, Nanapashamit and Wind Song and uh, people like that. They, Sue Blake. They were all trying to t like. I thought that I needed to learn what it was like or, or the native traditions, and I realized that all the traditions that they were teaching me were pretty much everything that my parents. They were, it was my parents' lives. They wasn't, they weren't teaching me anything different than what my parents had taught me. Like um, they would like tell us like the seasonal things that we would do. And I'd be like, we, okay. I was thinking we do that anyways. <laughs> um, so I came, you know, I love the, the sonnets, but you know, my heart is my Seekonk Poconoke band. And um, so I'm, I'm a, what do you call it? Um, adopted by them. And then, you know, my Aunt Eleanor Spears Dove, um, she's my father's cousin. I was pretty much taken under her wing because uh, my parents died really early and she was, uh, you know, she was pretty much their buddy. You know, they hung around together growing up. So I spent a lot of time with her and, you know, the Dove family and they were, they still are great mentors to me and um, vice versa. Julie Martin, um, taught me how to do twine. And I had three kids when she was teaching me and I was like a spider web. <laughs> I, could, <laughs> I could not get anything to work for me because I was too preoccupied. Plus I have ADHD, so I couldn't concentrate that long. So what I found that the only thing that could keep me to concentrating is painting. Painting, drawing pictures brings me the closest to the creator because I, I mean, I've known, you know, when you get so many, when you get your messages from the creator, every message that I ever had was, I'm here to make art. I'm here to say that we're here. So that's what I do. And uh, so I ended, so I was doing that for a long time, you know, making paintings of native people, all the Eastern Woodland people around here. And then somebody told me that what I was doing was what they were getting a master's degree in cultural sustainability. So they said I should apply. So I applied, they accepted. And next thing I know, um, some of the tribes got together and paid for my tuition. And I was like, damn, if this isn't what I should do, then I don't know. So I ended up with a master's degree. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so then I ended up with oh, a master's degree in arts. And um, mm -hmm. so from there, but before that, you know, I was doing things like teaching kids. Uh, I, I was always put in um, my employment, no matter what I did, I was always put as a person to advocate for the native youth. So I was an academic advisor for the Pequots for years. I was a GED educational teacher. I worked for the museum. I worked then when I saw the Narragansetts, um, you know, at the smoke shop, when the state police were attacking them, then I felt bad for the kids because I knew I had a really hard time um, processing that. So that's when I started making murals. But before I was doing that, I volunteered for the uh, VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America, to pay back some of my tuition from the first degree. And uh, so I was mentored under, there was a group of us that were in a gallery, we we're all artists, we were mentored under a name named Munir. 
he was from Ghana and his wife was Linda Avant Deshini. She was native too. And uh, he taught us pretty much how to do murals. We did murals all over uh, the, the state um, as part of our volunteer and service to America. So then when the Narragansetts had that big melee, then that's when I helped uh, Loren put together the New Eaton School. And that's when I, the, I applied for a grant from Smithsonian to um, be able to teach them how to live the opposites of co colonizational techniques. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we made four panels and that's hanging up in their museum. And then from there, I just, you know, murals just took over. I yeah. made one for the, this one, the Providence Preservation Society. That mm -hmm. was about, that was in 2019 or 20. That was to protect the Providence River to teach the public um, what has happened in 400 years to the river and how it's got polluted and what we can do to stop polluting it. And it was, it was commissioned by the Providence Preservation Society. And what they were trying to do was save the land on the banks of the river so that um, a big um, um, commercial outfit wasn't going to destroy it. So. Hmm. All my, all my pictures or um, murals are about communicating something. So mm -hmm. right now, the Fitz Foundation at Brown, they've been asking me to be their artist in residency for quite a while now. So I finally accepted, and you know, and so I'm doing something for them. And I, ugh. and I find that I thought that it, you know most of the time I think oh I'm not doing anything, and then. Like after the holidays, I was like, oh, you know, uh, I would like to just relax. But then I realized I was so behind in everything because I'm doing the proposal to get the um, Native American, um, whatever, um, tourism company up. And and then somebody <laughs> wants to buy the uh, tour. So I'm trying to copyright that. And, oh, it's, so, it's Deborah, it sounds, it sounds like, sounds like you've got, so many irons in the fire. It's unbelievable. Then, I could, I, I could, I was, I, I don't know if you were watching the reactions of people on the screen with us. I, uh, in particularly, uh, particular Liz, uh, I think can really identify with so, and I've heard her say almost the same words as you in terms of a certain uh, miss, a, 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 a wrong I don't even know how to express it but it's not an erasure but it's just a it's a poor presentation of native people and how uh, how uh, alienated one feels uh, in that regard and and you know you don't look the way you're supposed to look and all that so anyway I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Dan to jump in because the, the Dan's been working yeah I, I don't know if he's the only one's got a day job but uh, uh, some of us older people get to uh, do what we want and Dan's working for a living so as as we all are in different ways but uh, Dan if you want to I'm gonna slide over from Deborah into to what Dan has to say and, and I'm still a lot of what Deborah said is resonating with me and I know with with the rest of the people. I hope this is going to generate some questions. Uh, but Dan, do you want to you want to take it a little bit and talk to us about uh, what you're up to? All right, Goi Goi and Zibioani, Pakwanogzian, Ndelawizi, Quilavatonk, Ta Nudziawi, Nolhiganek. Hello, everyone. My name is Dan Shears. Um, I'm enrolled with the Nolhegan Abenaki community of the Northeast Kingdom in Vermont. I am a, or I should say, I used to be a cultural and historical educator at Plymouth Plantation, um, now called Plymouth Patuxent Museums from 2013 to 2016. I held the title of men's technology supervisor for the latter parts of those years. Um, I am a bead worker, uh, traditional hide tanner, uh, birch bark artisan, and I currently hold the title of material culture advisor for our um, historical and cultural preservation department within our community. Um, so I, I kind of have a large range of things that I do and 
I guess uh, we can talk a little bit about the beadwork. That seems to be one of my, um, I guess, the best things that I'm pretty good at. Um, that sort of developed over time. When I started becoming interested in my culture, that was around my junior year in high school. Um, I do not have anyone in my family that has anything to do really with our culture. So it's really just me. And that meant that I had to pretty much teach myself. Um, so when it came to the beadwork, I was doing things very simply. I, you know, went to Michael's and bought one of those loom beadwork kits and started making um, loomed pieces that way. And then I bought some books that talked about beadwork and their, their techniques. So then I would try to replicate that in the best way that I could. And then that, you know, it's just like with anything, it's practice makes perfect. So as the years went by and I started to get a little bit better, um, I met over Facebook, I should say, um, not personally, I met a woman, an Anishinaabe woman named Jessica Goki, who is a very beautiful and talented bead worker. Um, she was offering classes on beadwork and I figured, you know, maybe there's still something that I could learn from another artisan. So um, I really had a hard time coming up with my own designs. So that's one of the reasons why I chose to take her class. Um, she was offering uh, patterns that she had made so that we could use to um, practice our beadwork. Um, actually, I have one um, piece that I recently created that um, was featured in uh, was it what it was what was it called, David? The Beaver Moon. Yeah, the the uh, yeah, was, I forget actually. We just called it the Beaver Moon Gathering, I think. Yeah, and that was yeah. Had a lot in, of in November, right? So that was for Nolambika, and this was one of the pieces that I had. Oh yeah, featured at that exhibit. Mm -hmm. So my work has definitely come a long way. Um, the stuff that I started doing is never going to see the light of day. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's. I mean, I have a little bit of a different story. Uh, than the other panelists, you know, whereas I come from an area of the state where there's not really a large native community or native presence. So I'm pretty much left to either doing things myself or traveling places if and when I can afford it um, to learn things. Um, and kind of talk a little bit about that, um, wrapping it up with our um, Tribal Historic Preservation Department. We were hired recently by the Springfield Museums to help um, revamp their native exhibit along with another native consultation firm. So that's a really big project that I'm excited for that's gonna be um, hopefully coming up, I believe, next month and running till the end of the year. And um, back in October, um, I had gone out to Western Pennsylvania for vacation and also to visit a lot of historical museums that are out there. Um, one, because I wanted to go and two, being the material culture advisor for our preservation department, I wanted to photograph the artifacts that I could find at the museums to add to our collections um, and our files for the department. And I ended up making a partnership with the Fort Ligonier Museum and our department, which is also gonna consist of consultation services. And hopefully if this COVID nonsense decides to stop at some point, we will be giving living history presentations. 
So I'm really looking forward to doing work with them as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dan. Um, Dan, uh, th there's a number of experiences we had uh, just in a short amount of time over the past year or two. Dan uh, participated in the, uh, let's say, the construction. And in some ways, it was the, a burning out of our uh, Michoun dugout uh, up at Peskyomskut two years ago. And... Uh, we, Dan, participated in the construction of that, along with uh, Jonathan Perry of the uh, Aquina Wampanoag. And we really were super proud to have been able to launch that mission. I would say without too much exaggeration, it was more than likely the first mission on that river in at least 300, if not 400 years, given the fact that... Uh, tribal people at the falls uh, after the massacre in 1676 uh, left the area. And that contributed to a lot of the trauma that both Deb, Deborah and Liz could talk about in the sense that um, you could not be identified as an Indian, or you better not be. And if you were, uh, you could possibly be in some no small amount of danger. Uh, I would use the information that I heard also from the Elnu Abenaki people that work with us, like Roger Longto, Rich Holshu, uh, who, especially in Vermont, uh, there was an active eugenics program going on in Vermont. And people didn't dare be identified as Indians because they could be forcibly sterilized. And that was on the books until the last 20 years, although I don't think it was actually going on for more than 30 years ago. But that's how bad it was in Vermont. And it's no wonder that uh, Native people of Beneke and others uh, stayed under the radar. I know from information that um, people from Eliza's community shared with us, especially David Talpine White, who has passed on, but who is a, an incredible spiritual leader. Uh, there were serious issues with being an Indian. Deborah related that, the question of alienation, the question of being considered so different that you weren't even there. Uh, Liz has talked to us about that before too. So, and Dan, Dan brings up a, a different point, which is isolation. You know, who do you turn to if your family doesn't want to identify? Uh, and your family was uh, afraid to maintain a culture or didn't care to. So this has been really part of this experience tonight, not only hearing about people's mentors, mentoring and mentorship and, and art, but also to give the uh, people in the audience a sense of what it's like to be a native these days in the Northeast. And it's pretty challenging. Um, I think, and I hope that the, we're rounding a corner, but you know, very hard to tell. Very hard to tell what the future holds. Um, I think, uh, why don't we um, see if Jason has a few questions and if someone in the, uh, the, some of the participants would like to say or ask a few things, uh, we can get back to one of the earlier questions too. So what do you think, Jason? Uh, yes, the, the main question is how do folks keep in contact with you and also, you know, follow you, follow your work and support the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, do you have a site or a, a way people, uh, we'll go around the, around the screen, but Jennifer, do you do anything? I know you and I are kind of, we're very suspicious of social media. So who knows? Okay. Well, I do have a website, barkbasketsbyjlee.com. Um, you know, I, I tend to it maybe once every 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe five. 
you know, the, the baskets that I make, I, there's pictures there, but the baskets are always changing. So somebody could go on the site and look at baskets, um, but mm -hmm. you have to call me on the telephone. I, ha I have grown up, I do have email. I have mm -hmm. this Facebook uh, with this movie project, it's become a necessity and, and a blessing in a way. Um, so I am on Facebook. Um, and I do have, uh, I have a telephone. <laughs> um, so yeah, and I'm yeah. in the field. I'm listed, you know, the tele, mm -hmm. remember the telephone books, you know, <laughs> the telephone that's attached to the wall. So you never <laughs> lose it, remember those. <laughs> no, I do have a cell phone too, so. <clears throat> Jennifer, Jennifer mentioned in passing a video. Um, I just want to put in a plug for that. So um, that has really forced Jennifer into the 20th century. I won't say 21st yet, but uh, she is uh, in charge of a video program for which uh, Diane Dix has, of the Nola Rica Project has worked really hard and pulled together um, contributions from local cultural councils are almost, I think about 30 or 40 local cultural councils in the Valley. Uh, and it is, a, uh, uh, you wanna say something about the content of the, of the video and the purpose, Jen? And then we'll ask uh, Liz to see if she's got, if she's in the 20th century with us or the 21st, yeah. Okay, so yeah, Diane Dix, uh, powerhouse. Yeah, she got 50 towns contributed to the project asking for Nolan Beagle Project to make a video for the schools. So the basic content is um, a, a history program in the wigwam, which I've been doing at schools for about 30 years. Um, I basically talk about what I'm learning. And so the history program uh, in the wigwam, I'm talking about pre-contact life ways and differing worldviews, how the Europeans viewed land and leaders and women and uh, compared to how native people view land and leaders and women. And then we have uh, a couple of interviews with esteemed elders like Liz Santana Kaiser and Tom Porter. And we have a couple of artists, uh, really unknown artists um, from the area, one who does carving, amazing carving, and one who does quill work on birch bark. So it's kind of like the purpose is to get the kids to see, to learn some of the history, learn the tribes in the area that they live in, uh, to meet some native elders and hear their words and meet some native artists and see their artwork, to, to understand that native people are still here and here's the culture. And we're just trying to do it all from the positive. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. It's a work in progress. Um, we're shooting for when uh, the uh, the early summer uh, to have it done. It was supposed to be done last August, September. Right Ooh. now, the deadline is February first. <laughs> okay, we're scrambling. All right, very good. So, um, yeah, Jason, is there something? Otherwise, I'll ask Liz. Um, after Liz, uh, there there's another question from the audience. Yeah, okay, Liz, do you uh, are you in the 20th century with us or are you or I'm beyond? Getting, I am getting there. I have my daughter yeah. who is the brain of all that oh, yeah. stuff, all right. and that's really she's helpful. actually working on on my medicine bags and getting it up and going. But for the time being, I am on Facebook. Um, mm -hmm. You can contact me on Facebook as well as I have a home phone number too. So if you wanted to get in touch with me. David, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. I don't yeah. know what it is. Yeah. I didn't hear you, Deborah. Can you type it in the chat so we have your contacts? Um, yeah, I'm going to have my daughter do that because if I touch something, I'm going to lose everybody. I know so, what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm going to have her do that for me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I will have her do that for me. Um, thanks, thanks, Liz. Okay. Uh, Jason, did you have, there's a question out there. Yes, and this question actually comes from someone that I think many of the panelists know well. Uh, the illustrious Justin Beatty has uh -huh. asked what the artists feel has been most effective for each of them garnering interest, not only in their work, but in their work as it relates to their respect respective tribal identities. Mm -hmm. If Dan feels inspired, I'll ask him. So, uh, otherwise, we can... Anybody else could could raise your hand and go with it. Sure. I don't mind putting Dan on the spot. 
<laughs> um, I guess the best way I can answer that is my job with our cultural and historic preservation department. Um, being the material culture advisor, that means that anything that our department does, whether that is in written form or um, presentations like either tonight or what I did for you guys, David, at Nolambika, or living history, where there's a specific time period that we are portraying, it's my responsibility to make sure that everything is correct for that time period. So let's say 18th century. Um, I have to go through every single thing that is going to be presented to the public and absolutely make sure it has some sort of documentation for it. If there is something that is in question, then we state that this is what we believe based on whatever sources that we have. Um, I often say, even though it's a very sore subject in a way, it pains me to say it, but here being here in the Northeast, there is a ton of our culture that is just gone. And unfortunately there's no getting it back, but there are things that are still out there that we can access that um, we can do to bring back that knowledge to our communities. And that's um, kind of related to that. That's what my traditional name actually refers to. Quilawatonk means, I guess roughly translated means knowledge seeker. It's someone who searches for knowledge and uses their their gut and their heart to lead them. So, and it kind of directly ties into my job at, for, with the historical department. Mm -hmm. So okay. I have my nose in so many, I mean, I have, I have a pile of books that are sitting in front of my bookshelf right now because my bookshelf is full. I need to find <laughs> myself a new bookshelf. Um, <laughs> but I am always constantly in period sources, firsthand accounts, um, trade lists, things like that, to hopefully bring back some sort of knowledge to my community. Great, thank you, thank you, Dan. Uh, anybody else want to field that question from Justin? Any further, or has Dan covered the ground really well? That's for sure. Um, okay. Yeah, Jason got something else for us or? Um, so we don't have another question currently from the audience, but I actually have a question for, for everyone um, and, and kind of a, a comment, um, you know, Hauka from uh, California, uh, I'm of Shumash, uh, Kumie and Tepehan uh, uh, descent. Um, hearing about the baskets has actually been amazing for me because basketry plays such an important part for indigenous Californians. Um, and I just, uh, how did you find community with each other in the Northeast? Um, Cause I do know as a transplant, it, it's oftentimes, it feels very, very lonely to be an indigenous person and to have to explain, you know, indigenousness across our area. So um, how do you each find that kind of community? Mm -hmm. I'll go with, yeah, Deborah, go right ahead. Well, I worked at a place called Native American Lifelines for quite a while. And um, that was for anyone who wanted to come and learn about their culture, um, if they were you know, indigenous or Native Americans. So I don't know everybody's culture but I know how to support somebody that is looking for their culture. So that's what I used to do for four or five years. And uh, for me to keep community is to, um, well, first of all, community is for me, since we haven't left this area, are my relatives and my relatives are all, all around me. So, um, but I get that, you know, sometimes you're the only person in the family that wants to embrace the native culture and not assimilate, you know? And I'm so glad that somebody just posted like going, live, 
knowing your culture doesn't mean that you're going back into the past. It means that you're bringing the wisdom from the ancestors to, to contemporary times. So, um, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I always forget the question by the time I'm done. No, <laughs> yeah, this is great. Places, uh, Jason, there's places like, I don't know where you live. Do you live in Boston near that area? The community houses, the Indian um, councils, things like that. You know, but they're not. Yeah, open. I'm actually in Holyoke currently. Well, I'm I'm in California currently because I'm here with, <laughs> but I live in Holyoke. Yeah, I mean, go on the powwow um, list and see when the powwows are. Um, you know, just just branch right out and whoever you know that's native, let ask them what's going on. But it's really hot for us now in the pandemic. You know, uh, so I'm lucky because I do a lot of outdoor. Uh, murals so I'm out the, I'm outside anyways so I don't have to worry about that but um, Jason's question I mean uh, Justin Beatty's question I wanted to touch a little bit on that what I was taught was to just be your authentic self always just be your authentic self and if you and if you want to get your name out do a certificate of authenticity for your work with your work so, so to show that you're your authentic self in I was taught by many medicine men and women to never worry about what other people are doing. Just be your best self. All things that bother you, they'll take care of themselves. You don't have to worry about other things outside of your own personal being. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Those are words that uh, were echoed at one point. Jennifer brought a guest to our uh, uh, board, uh, Tatiana. Jen, I can't remember her full name, uh, but basically she uh, she did say very close to the same words as Deborah. Be yourself and just don't get hung up on other what other people are thinking or saying because you know you can't please everybody and you don't even need to try. Well, you can't control it either. Yeah, exactly. Control is yourself. Yep, Jennifer, did you have did you have something to say there? Yeah, I just wanted to say to Jason, you know, I hear you and it, it is the big, it is so hard. And the powwows is how I've met people, the powwows and anything educational that has anything to do with Native people. And the Nolambika Project, I think, you know, that's what I consider to be the closest Indian center that I know. You know, we're not close to the Boston Indian Center, but uh, the museums have had to travel and the pandemic has really hurt us that way. I think it drove me to actually look at Facebook because I just miss people, um, you know, and I keep saying to Dan, well, let's have a craft gathering here at my house. But it's like, well, we got to get enough COVID tester kits first <laughs> to be responsible. But that's yeah, how yeah, I'm yeah. thinking, you know, <clears throat> yeah. let's do that. It, um, we, we need that, you know, I think about that, like anyone who's Christian has a church anywhere. Jewish people have a synagogue anywhere. Where is our longhouse? Where's our gathering point? You know, Boston Indian Center, Kearsage Indian Museum in New Hampshire. Uh, there's a, an Indian Museum in, in Washington, Connecticut. Um, mm -hmm. It's rough. I think this is the uh, fledgling Okiteo in yeah. um, oh, yeah. Asheville. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 I'm looking that, at this through the optic of an educator. I, 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 I'm quite sure that Jason's question was rhetorical in a sense, you know, what do you all, how do you all find community and connect? Uh, so I think the answers have been really great. Yeah, Liz? Yeah, I can say for myself, I'm staying connected with my community and other folks as well. Um, really has been for myself through my children, my grandchildren, um, we, we have a big family and we have a big tribe as well. And so doing that, it's like everybody's is zooming in, which is really good. Um, we've had a few events where we were able to get together before the rise of this virus going up again. Um, but again, like most folks were saying, the powwows was a big, big way of us getting together and families would come across all across the country to come to the powwows just to be mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. So that is our biggest 
things, our powwows, in our in our, all a lot of our other events as well. We have the planting moon, we have the strawberry moon. I mean, we have a lot of ceremonies that would bring us together um, that we haven't been able to do. Um, so hopefully, you know, at some point in time, things will get better. We will live to learn with this thing that's out here and, and um, begin to live again and go back to mm-hmm. what right. we do as a people. Right. I'll, I'll jump in uh, only in, I try to see things through the eyes of people who are not yet connected, either non-tribal people or some people have a sense that it's somewhere in their family there was a tribal person. But let's say, uh, I think that the powwows are an incredible way of doing it. I've been to a number of uh, the Nipmuc, Liz, Liz's communities powwows, incredibly welcoming uh, people who want to know more about native culture in the valley. I think that once the powwows pick up, I want to uh, make sure that you all uh, note that Justin Beatty has lined up a powwow uh, in Amherst on Amherst Common. You better check that out. It, uh, I, I can't, I think it's in May. Justin may mention that, but those for local people in the Valley, that's, that's a very local power as are some of the, of the Nipmuc powers not far away. Uh, just on the other side of uh, Athol, Orange, Worcester, Dudley, you name yes. it. Grafton, those are places where I th- these types of things happen and, and everyone can go. I mean, you don't have to be an Indian to go. You can right. be there. And if you are respectable, respectful, here is Justin put it up there, May 28th and 29th. Right. Excellent. Thank you, Justin. I knew it was that right in that vicinity <laughs> in downtown Amherst. So that'll be an event you don't want to miss. Uh, good. Okay. Um, we are coming up on uh, the time to say Aquene and good evening and really need. Mentor has to say. Well. Let's see if there's any more. Jason, are you seeing any more questions? We have a few more minutes. No, I believe I, I believe we are. Everyone has been answered. Okay. Right. Well, I've been trying. I've been trying to put. Um, yeah. Some of the emails and contact information was getting sent just to the hosts and panelists, so I was trying to put that in to everyone. But, but I believe you know that anyone out there who wants to get in touch with any of these artists and learn more about their work. You know, just get in touch with David through the Nolan Beaker Project or through Valley Arts Mentors. We're happy to connect you. Mm-hmm. And on behalf of Valley Arts Mentors, um, I just want to thank everyone, Deborah, Dan, Jennifer, Liz, and David, and Jason for being on here tonight, sharing your experiences. Um, so valuable. And we often, you know, we've, we've, typically get requests, you know, when is this going to be available? And typically uh, Scott McPherson, the hardworking executive director of Holyoke Media, who's making all the tech work in the background, will have this up uh, and available, uh, not next week, but the week after. You you can check artsmentors.org. There's a webinar uh, link and you can see some of the other webinars that have been hosted. So, uh, Last shout out to our funders, Mass Cultural Council, Community Foundation of Western Mass, Mass Humanities for making this possible. And thanks again, everybody. This was just so inspiring. Yeah, great. Yeah, I do want to say I, uh, I always am in awe and I kind of say, I hope you all in the audience and, and also among us, the artists, that we realize what just happened. It was quite a coming together there was an incredible amount of very personal sharing uh, a sense of there's there's a bit of sadness but there's also a lot of hope Uh, people expressed what it was like the alienation that could happen the isolation and how to find community how to express 
what you're feeling through art and through your art. So um, I'm just very appreciative of all of those of you who uh, spent some time with us tonight and uh, all good friends now after this. So thank you very much from the Nolamika Project from myself. And I hope, I know I'll see you all in the near future. Mm -hmm.